Hi, what I would respect your time, so we're at 6.36, so we'll get started. Thank you so much for being here at Decatur Parents Network, Parents, you know, um, Speaker Series, yes. I don't even remember y'all's title, we have changed it around so many times, to draw people in. I think we did a good job drawing you in with our titles and playing with the words. Um, I am Jen Walcott, and I'm on the leadership of Decatur Parents Network, along with, I have Kunle Agunye here, is new on our leadership team. Terry Moore, um, one of your speakers tonight, is on our leadership team. And we haven't had others. Usually Joel Gould, who's an expert on this camera, would be recording this. We only do this not to capture you, but to capture it so that people who couldn't make it tonight can go on our YouTube channel and see it later when we upload it. Um, I want to, um, so we're in November right now, so we've offered something every month so far since we got going this school year. Um, we are working on something for December. Um, I'll give some teasers on it. Um, we're not sure we can pull it off for um, December. It'll be December or January. But we know that a lot of people might over that break buy um, electronics for kids or update electronics. Um, we've had some fabulous folks in the school district and other experts reach out to us and they want to talk to you about what they know about the electronics in our children. Especially from the mental health perspective of it, what we're really starting to find um, how it's affecting all of us, actually, our mental health, if we're really using that stuff so much. But um, how you can make it more useful, how you can make it um, less of something damaging to our futures. So we're playing with that with a panel that we want you to hear, and that will be December or January, so please watch for that. You signed in tonight, and we kept playing with our sign-in sheets every time you see us. Tonight we put a statement on the bottom, and you can go run over there and scratch off your name if you don't agree to it. But on the bottom it says, if you've signed in on that sheet, you agree to let us at least put you in our thing to send you more information about our programming. In, at the same time, it will ask you to actually become a member of the, the, in, uh, the program. Um, there's no money involved. It's really just taking that extra step that says, I've really looked at this stuff and I've looked at the pledge and I agree to parenting this way in the city of Decatur. Um, so, we'll send you information on that if that's not familiar to you. But signing in, if you want to scratch off your name, it just means we won't be emailing you. If you signed your name, we are going to email you. We thank you for being here. Um, I know how busy the season is. Uh, I have three kids. Um, I work. I do this. So. I know. So I know that you're here because you care about our kids, and I appreciate that. So our speakers tonight, they're going to dive into the data that is the most recent, that is specific to our kids indicator. And they'll walk you through how we look at data, how, how you feel about that, and then um, op um, give some tips and everything about what we do about that information. Um, looking at all our kids. Most of us want to sit there and say, well, my kid's not going to do this. Well, great then help them be an influence on your neighbor's kids. Let's talk about, you know, we're going to care about all our kids as we go through this. So I'm going to open it up to, um, I don't know if, uh, raise your hand if you are a middle school parent. Oh, so you know this guy. Uh, raise your hand if you're a high school parent. Raise your hand if you're below middle school. Raise your hand if you're below middle school only. Okay, we, we, we got to work on that crowd. Okay, so um, most of you then know Greg Wiseman is the principal here at Renfro Middle School. He was brought in um, as an interim, and of course we all knew how much we needed him here. And so thankfully after all the application process, he um, stayed on with us. And I, I'm hoping he's still loving it. I've known him for years because he was also... Yes, he was principal at Winona Park Elementary where all three of my children went and I worked there. So I've always appreciated his work and his, um, and he has his own kids and he's been through this. We, we can put that out there. And, I'm gonna do this. So, and he's going to speak alongside Terry Moore. Terry Moore is on our leadership for Decatur Parents Network, but we pulled her in because of her expertise. She's been working in prevention in Decatur. We're still trying to track it down. We're, we're looking at maybe, but 
we don't want to throw out years because then it speaks of age. But maybe around 30 years, she's been working in a prevention indicator uh, with our schools and everything. So she is the current executive director of um, Decatur Prevention and Initiative. So you can see why we pulled her on our Decatur Parents Network team. She's got that. She's got grants behind her. She's got funding behind her. But she's got all the expertise and knowledge and resources to bring in the information that helps inform how we can work as parents helping all our kids. So I open it to them. Hi, thank you, Jen. Um, so thank you for coming. Uh, we're going to do a couple things. I'm going to start off with doing a, a, a data dive protocol with you guys that I've really pared down to kind of get to the essence of this, uh, to look at real data that the kids of Decatur have given us um, for the last five years. Um, so after we do that, and, and we're going to identify some things that are important <coughs> to you, and then um, Terry's going to go through a lot of like the things that we can do to help, and then we want to definitely leave a lot of time for your questions. Okay, so if oh, maybe you. you guys can help pass those out. Um, as, as Terry's passing them out now, that I know like I'm breaking the cardinal rule of a slideshow, mm -hmm. like where like on slides you just have a couple things mm -hmm. and there's like a bunch oh, God, of stuff yeah. there. You're not gonna have to look at this. What um, Terry's passing out right now is what this is. But I just before we do this data dive, I want to describe to you how to look at this or show you how to look at this. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So what this is, um, this is Renfro data. Um, there's two sections. There is sixth grade data here, eighth grade data here. So sixth grade and eighth grade, and then by year. This is 2015 data, 2015 data, 16, 17, 18, 19. Okay, so it's Renfro data from sixth grade surveys, from eighth grade surveys in those years. And then it's broken down by category. Questions dealing with alcohol, marijuana, prescription drugs, and, uh, and school um, education. Oh, miscellaneous. Miss some miscellaneous things. Do you want to talk a little, maybe just like a, a what, is this sur what, was, what is this survey? Okay, this survey goes 75% um, of each grade level takes it. So it's not a small sample. Um, is it perfect? No. Let's just all acknowledge no self-reporting data is perfect. However, if you talk to the experts at CDC, they tell you it tends to be, people tend to under-report on self-reporting, not over-report. Um, but this is the best that we have for, on this one, this is going to be for the last four or five years. And this is our local data. It's done through the Georgia Department of Education. The survey changed a little bit this year, so you may see some blank spots because they took some questions off the survey. Okay. Um, but so, right. all the kids are getting it. Okay, so you have sixth grade information, eighth grade information, and then there's the question numbers that are here. We have the question numbers up here that correspond with the questions down here. Um, so these, so for question 50, the, the question is, during the past 30 days, on how many days did you have at least one drink of alcohol? These are the, that's question 50 here. Here are the responses in 2015, and the sixth graders responded 2%. In 2019, the sixth graders responded 4%, and so on, so on. So these are the questions that correlate, that correlate with that. Any questions on how this, okay, and I'll do this right now. This is my one pair. Who needs a pair of readers? <laughs> Anybody? Okay, okay, cool. Um, any questions on what, like, how, like, how this data is arranged? And you guys can get your own, the full report that has all kinds of information on the Georgia Student Health, on the Georgia Department of Education site. Question. Percent of students answering yes for any category, that's what you're showing there. Yes. Yes, okay. yes. Okay, so this is your task. For five minutes, I want you to just look at this data. All right? The first test, the, 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 after that five minutes, I'm going to ask you guys, you guys look at it, start talking amongst your little table. I'm going to ask each table to share, let me read, let me give you the exact reading. You're going to describe the data set. I'm going to ask what you see, and each table I'm going to want you to ask, to ask you to answer. I see, and then, like maybe it'd be descriptive in this column, in this question, that X percent of kids are doing this, this, and this, and this. Just the facts. Don't interpret. That's coming later. Just 
you're going to say, I see, like, and it's going to be something that maybe hmm, means something to you. And I'm going to record the I sees, and then we can come back and maybe reflect on those later. So you've got five minutes to look at the data, and then each table is going to, I'm going to, you're going to kind of agree upon maybe one thing that, that, that you see that interests you. Question. What is the negative, negative 1%? That means it's less than 1% that responded okay. yes. Okay. okay. And those risk questions, there's how risky do you think it is? And then parent question is how, how do you perceive what your parents think? And so if you Decatur High School parents, we're going to look at Decatur High stuff after this. Okay. Do we have a forward clicker? Just join his table, Miss Emma James. Uh, question three. The last slide says six percent were not five drugs on campus. Yeah, so six, pre is that, is that, is that, is that, I believe that's, uh, yes, that's 2019 data, and I believe that was a compilation for 2019 for sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. So six percent reported they were offered drugs on campus. Those drugs include alcohol, is it above marijuana? Drugs or drugs? Okay. So whether it's alcohol, vaping, Marijuana, drugs or drugs? Who knows how the kids interpret it? This is just a number. So that's what she'd like to say. Three by people. Great. Kunlay, I want to respond again to that. That could also be, if I remember how, exactly how that question reads, they may not have been handed the drug on campus. They were offered an opportunity to obtain it. Okay. So it doesn't necessarily mean it's coming to the school. Okay. It does mean that, hey, you know, I got some of this. You want some. Yeah. I think that's the question all the way down at the bottom of the page. Okay, about one more minute. Did y'all ask about the cigarette use? It's not recorded here. Is that the full report? Sure, so that may have changed over the years. There's a there's a lot like we we only like I think there's yeah, Terry Cherry pick something question. Oh yeah, just yeah. I'm sure it's asked, but I don't we need to. We weren't, we weren't seeing as much on cigarettes until high school anyway, but it's, it's available out there if you really want to dive. All right, I want to go ahead and move along and get to the, 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 the high school data, but is, do I have a table that, can vol that will volunteer to give me I see and what, what it is that they see that interests them? In the back, go ahead. Um, it looks like that in 2019 yeah. that there was a higher proportion of sixth graders that reported having a drink in the last 30 days than the eighth graders. At 4% of sixth graders in the year ending 2019, 
reported drinking in the last 30 days for his only What percent eighth graders? Three. <coughs> Okay, thank you. Someone else? Yes? It, it, it appears the numbers are going in the direction you don't want them to go over time. <laughs> you know, that's like okay, like, so... For instance, the 30-day... Um, I've had a drink in the last 30 days. Um, well, at least for the 6th graders. 2% 2015, 4% 2019. I don't know if that's a trend or not. It's only 5 data points. So just what, like, so what is it that you see? I, okay, so I see in a cup, on a couple of these items that the, the direction seems to be the wrong direction in terms of trend over time. So you see trends of use increasing or decreasing? Um, not just of use. Well, increasing on the use, but then also, for instance, um, even just the percent of, there was another one, I'm sorry, I've lost it, but the, um, maybe it was the risk, the risk one, number 105, even there, the, the perception of risk seems to be decreasing, and the incidence of 30-day drinking is increasing, those are the two I've noticed. So the, the, on those two, the, the, when the, you would hope that the numbers would go in the other direction. Okay. Time. Anybody else, what they see, uh, yes? I see that 45... Students attempted suicide in 96 on phone. Is that over is that, five years? Right? Is, that, is that the number that it actually says? One year. That little miscellaneous data down there is a one year. <sighs> is that sixth grade or eighth grade? Or that's the entire school for Renfro. Oh, this is what they're reporting. Surely that's. Uh, it would target have been 75% of Renfro students, which would have been 900 and something. Do you have previous year's data for that? Excuse me? So this is just one year. What about the previous years? You can go, but I didn't pull all of that. It get, this data gets to be so overwhelming. Yes. Yeah. Can I just have a question about the reporting? So are the kids reporting this anonymously on an yes. online survey? Or are they doing online it? survey anonymously. Okay. What is the proportion of students that completed it? I don't, I, I don't know. I think it's 75%. Hmm? 75% 75 have to take the test, and I don't know that, I haven't heard anybody complain, I'm, I, I'm pretty sure they wouldn't, if we were, if it was a significant number, we would be getting our hands slapped. Okay. Mm -hmm. In the back there. Yes. Nope, you. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. It seems the eighth graders over the sixth graders are saying that they have not been taught um, about uh, something about drugs uh, in the last year. Well, can you, can you point six, to that? Number 66. Number 66. Overall, the eighth graders are saying that it's a lower percentages, hinting that they didn't get school, edu school ed or, or drug education in that last year. Received less. 2019, they did not ask the question. They number took the 66? question off the survey. Yeah. No, number 66, they reported no. no. Which suggests they have. Doesn't that mean that they have received the education? Well, they say uh, the question uh, is, have you received education? And, and low numbers are saying yes. They're saying no. But the, it says they're so the percentage reported so is the no's. No, no, no. At not. Okay, so they, 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 they so is it, so is that in, I'm sorry, is that inverse then? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. That's right. That's really true. Yeah. So we are trying. I didn't. I did not interpret it right. <laughs> and then Vivian seems to be doubling the responses, doubling for eighth graders with Vivian overall. Yes. Um, it looks like their perception of risk is really going off of what she was trying to say in her second point, I think the perception of risk is decreasing each year. And also, the younger they are, as they get older, their perception of risk of using alcohol or something is decreasing as well. Yes. I see that um, most kids will agree, though, that their parents would view. Um, okay, show me where you're looking. Uh, so I'm looking at 108 and 109. Okay. And I see that 
most kids will agree that their parents would um, view those behaviors unacceptable. Mm -hmm. uh, alcohol or drug use as unacceptable. Mm -hmm. okay. So that's like, so majority or most? Yes. <coughs> okay, stop that. And do you want me to hand out the green ones now, Greg? Uh, yeah. Oh, wait. Okay. <coughs> okay. And last one. Yes, in the back. I noticed in 71 that 0% say that they have ever um, driven. I guess they're not old enough to drive, most of them. But that they are riding with people who are drinking. Or under the influence. And number 72. Mm -hmm. That riding is another one they took off. Okay. Let's be a parent. It could be a parent. It could be, yeah, it could be a parent. Okay. So the next one, Terry, is sending out same format, but it's Decatur High School. And it's 10th grade on the left, 12th graders on the right. Same format, same general questions. However, I want to point you to one thing before you jump into that. Let me point one thing. Um, this line here. So there's just some miscellaneous. And Terry, help me out here. This line here, 30-day use, th th these are not percentages. 3068 students reported heroin use. Non-medical use, 30 reported painkillers, 28 sedatives. Um, 44 stimulants, 127 self-harm, which is 11%. 47 attempted suicide, 4%. 11% offered drugs on campus. So that's just like a line of miscellaneous data. And those are out of the whole school? Yes. Yes. And like 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade will yes. all take this? Yes. And it was 75% for DHS? Yes. And in fact, up at the top, uh, and you'll see in parentheses, like the, just to give you an idea of the sample size, uh, uh, the class of uh, 2019, the 12th graders, there were 228 who completed the survey. You see that? Okay. Right at the very top there. Okay, so take five minutes to look at this Decatur um, information. I'm going to pass out this, this, a lot of numbers here, and it's, ex this is, this is just if you want to start comparing Decatur High to DeKalb County and Georgia. So this data here is Decatur High School, which is exactly what you have in front of you. Then the middle data set is DeKalb County. And then the next data set is the state of Georgia. Okay? So what you have in front of you in green is exactly what's there. And then it compares to Cab and Georgia. And we do have tissues, which is from crying. <laughs> and I have actually done this to local high schools that are nearby. Some people took offense at being compared to the Cab and Georgia and asked me to compare to North Druid Hills and Grady. And we still didn't look so good, folks. <laughs> that one. And you can go in and do that that dive yourself online at, at the Georgia Department of Ed. How do they interpret like 50 and 55? It says on how many days they were drinking five or more drinks in a row, but then what we get is a percentage. So, like, what does that mean? That just means how many of them reported at any point during the last 30 days that they binge drink. Okay. So, for instance, 21% of the high school, of the seniors said they had binge drink in the last month. Binge drink in the last month. And how, who takes this? Like, how is it given and who's selected to take it in high school? It's not selected. It's selected by a class, I believe, in terms of, like, Maybe one year they'll do math or 
language, language arts. I think it's language arts that usually goes in. Where do y'all put it, Greg, right here? I don't remember. You don't even remember, yeah. So it's kind of a random mix that people watch. Yeah. So in certain grades, you know they all have a certain class. So they hit that class that year yeah. and take it into every math class. So then you, you know you've hit the bulk of the students in that grade. And so we've done better than 75% over the years. But you, the state requires a minimum of 75. Not my rules. What's the definition of self harm? They do not give a definition on the survey. That's just... I have self-harmed. Well, I mean, in all of your questions, you use the term self-harm. <clears throat> self-harm is to do with taking out all the drugs. So okay, it exactly is not, same. it's not in the area, it's not in the same question area as the drug questions are. Okay. It is in the mental health component okay. of the survey. So it may even say tried to hurt yourself. Versus attempted suicide. I think those are the two different wordings. But, but don't quote me on that. Hmm? No, no, we're not counting drugs as self harm. At least I don't think they are. Now, cutting, yes. Do you have any explanation, and maybe maybe a good cover it in the course of the presentation? Why alcohol consumption and DHS is so high vis a vis the rest of the state? Yes, we will talk about that during my side my side of this. You think the data is accurate? Oh yeah. Public transportation. Oh yeah. People, yeah. Oh yeah. I'm sorry. No, no, no. I'm, I'm just amazed. I know. People are really amazed when they start looking at the comparison data. And yes, you can pick schools that are more socioeconomically similar to Decatur. Okay. Um, and our numbers are still high. We ranked pretty high. And we'll go into that during my presentation. So in 2019, it says that 228 seniors completed the questionnaire. How many seniors were there at Decatur High School in 2019? Oh, God. Um, I would say, how many, say, how many, say, how many, how many seniors? How many said, um, um, completed it? No, how many seniors were in the class, not how many that completed it? But I was asking you how many said they completed it. 228. 220. 300. <sighs> God, I would say I would say probably close to three. I mean, like my eighth grade is um, about f just over around four hundred, and they get progressively smaller as you get older. So I would say maybe three hundred ish, three something is my guess. I think that's right. This year I think it's three hundred, but the class sizes have differed. So right. Yeah. And the older classes, the upper classes, were when the system was a little smaller too. All right, what do you see? Okay, don't okay, don't interpret, don't make judgment, but what is it that you see? We're looking at the white one now. Well, it it could be it could be the the white one that compares all three or if you want to just focus on the Decatur, the green one, that's fine too. I just threw the white one in there just so you, if you wanted to start comparing, but it can be any of them. If you want to compare do, do your data from the white one that compares all three fine, or just the Decatur? Yes? I see that alcohol use is much higher in Decatur than in DeKalb or Georgia. Okay. Do you want numbers? Nope. Okay. So is marijuana use, I'm told. <laughs> and we have somebody over here. Then, um, then okay. Okay, next. And over here. I see that between the 10th grader and 12th graders of DHS um, students at the very bottom, number 53, the e-cigarettes vaping, is it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It dramatically increases towards the older grade. And here? Is regular and is that this Was that last year or every year? Every year. 16 versus 25, 18 versus 35. <laughs> okay. 
Okay. And you um, I, I see that uh, kids' perception of their parents' disapproval is lower than it was in middle school. I don't see regular cigarettes. You don't. There's only so much I can put on four. <laughs> it's out there. We'll cover a little bit of that in my, my presentation. The perception of parent disapproval is lower in high school or? It, uh, in middle school. Is no, in, in high school. It's lower in high school. school. In middle school, it's like in the 90%. And in high school, it's in the 80%. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I see on the white sheet, numbers 101 and num numbers 102, um, the perception of risk with drinking is pretty similar across all the districts, um, even though the numbers are not, you know, people who actually drink are, aren't similar. Mm -hmm. So across Georgia? Right, across Georgia. Similar. Good observation. Okay. Yes. Uh, I see that among the percent Students responding have self-harmed and 4% have attempted suicide. Say that again. That 11% of the students responding have self-harmed and 4% have attempted suicide. One more. Go ahead. I see that between Decatur High School 12th grade parents and Georgia, we have a significantly lower um, parents' perception or the kids perceiving that the parents are going to disapprove marijuana. So it looks like here it's more accepted, or the kids perceive that more, the marijuana. more accepting of it. Mm -hmm. <coughs> So, the, did, was, there any, was there any more? Yeah. yeah more. Um, Decatur kids are drinking and driving more and riding with people that have been drinking. <coughs> okay. Um, okay, so, last step before we turn it over to Terry. Any connect, any dissonances or... Um, between the Renfro data and the Decatur Head data and the Georgia data and the DeKalb data, intersections or dissonances um, from these? What, any, are you seeing patterns? Are you seeing things that seem to make sense? Are you seeing things that like absolutely make no sense? Marijuana is used in Decatur High School is above the average for both the state, both the county and the state. The answer is yes. Or higher. Number, that's number 54. That's 30 day use. <laughs> yeah, um, is that because we have one high school? No. Percentages or percentages? Anything else? All right, let's get, let, let's, we'll let Terry kind of get into some of the reasonings that, you know, with her expertise is behind some of this. Um, some of this is going to be really interesting. Some of this is going to be kind of tough to hear. Um, and then uh, we'll give us, you know, plenty of time to ask us questions and, you know, specific about, I, can, I, I might not have a lot of answers about Decatur High, but I can, you know, talk about, um, you know, more things about Renfro. Um, but, and, but Terry has like the, the big kind of picture about the whole town and the whole uh, area. So, okay. All right. Roll over to mine. I do want to say to you guys, um, any of you who are interested in my PowerPoint presentation tonight, I've already uploaded it for you onto our website, uh, which is decaturpi.org. Decaturpi.org. 
preventioninitiative.org. Um, and it's just right down in the middle of the page. Click on that, and there's all of this stuff so that if you want more of it. Um, first off, let me, let me tell you, this was never meant really, when I designed this and put this together, this was not meant for a parent discussion initially. This was Terry's cheat sheet. This was what I was using as my cheat sheet when I was going out and talking. Um, and then I shared it with a few people who were around our coalition table, and they were like, oh my God, we all need to be seeing this. And so that has kind of been where this has grown. And the first time I showed this to Dr. Duty, he said, oh, and he had just come in. I mean, he was so new. And he said, oh. And I says, and my coalition wants to know what you're going to do about this. And he says, well, just let them know we don't ignore data here. And that is something that I really give you this here, too, in that we have administration who is not ignoring data. However, I do want to say, Yes, there are kids who are give, given the opportunity at school to then get high after school, on the weekends, whatever, but this is not a school problem. This is a community issue. Um, it's not just, oh, well, this is just, let the school handle the data. The school knows this, okay. but we're trying to get our parents to know this. We can go on. Um, why should we talk with our kids? Parents play a critical role, guys. If parents don't know what's going on, you can't have a reasonable conversation with your child. So we really want to make sure that you know that you are the barrier to their using. And you may not feel it sometimes because they will happily tell you that you don't know what you're talking about, that you have no idea, um, but kids do listen. They will tell you they don't listen, la, 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 but they really are. And we are finding that kids whose parents talk to them are less likely to use. And we also know that if you choose to talk with your kids about this, we're seeing they, they then are perceiving that you're disapproving, right? And someone in here noticed that little piece of data that just blows me away every time I see it. As parental disapproval goes up, drug use goes down. And so this is why it's critical for you to talk. And it's often more effective to talk before they start alcohol or other drugs. This one focuses on alcohol on this slide, but on any drugs. And some of our kids, though, we are seeing are trying alcohol as early as nine. Okay, nine is what? Fourth grade? Yes. Third grade. Third grade. Okay. Ah! Okay. If you do not talk about it, you're still saying something. <coughs> Next. Okay. This one you can't see quite as well, um, so, but I'm going to tell you what it says, okay? And this is, we did a survey in the community with parents. We did a community assessment, and we had um, over 400 parents do this survey with us, just throughout the community. And the blue line is the student reported use. The orange column is what the parents perceiving their use. See the difference? So the first column is alcohol, <coughs> second column is marijuana, third column is vaping. Every one of them, parents thought, their thought that generally kids were using twice as much as they are. Now why is that important? Thought. That's good, right? It means the reality is less, is what you're saying. Yes and no. Okay. You know, on one hand you can go, yes, yes, okay. On the other hand you're like, oh, what does this really mean? And I've had to go through all this prevention training. I've been doing this forever and ever. And I will tell you, expectations lead to behavior. Does it mean that if they know their own child is doing it, they're assuming, oh, well, everybody's doing it. So my kid isn't so bad. It minimizes it. If everybody is doing it, then it minimizes it. And so this is something that, and this is some data that's pretty new for us and that I took in and overlaid um, so that you could see that it is important for you to know the accurate numbers. <laughs> okay? Because truly, not everybody's doing this. If you look at the high school students, 23% of them have done alcohol in the last 30 days. 
18% marijuana, 21% vaping. That's overall. That's when I crunched the 9th through 12th graders. Okay, next. So what are they using? Name it, guys. Uh, there, it shows up in Decatur. If it's out there on the streets, it shows up somewhere in our city. Now, I'm not saying it's a large <laughs> number. Um, heroin? For the little chemical people in here. I didn't want to put another picture on here. That's the, that's the formula for heroin. As you saw, we are seeing heroin in our school. Or by, used by our, our young people. LSD, hallucinogens are back, and cocaine. We're hearing more about cocaine these days. Okay, next. Okay, this is one that um, we just picked seniors because this is when it, this is usually the height of their drug use. And I will give you a hint. Kids who go to college. How many of you in here have a child who's in college? Or have had one in college? Okay. <coughs> They don't tend to use less when they get there. Okay. <laughs> and so we wanted you to see kind of where we were at the top of things. Okay. So we're looking at in 2010, blue is alcohol, orange is binge drinking, green is smoking marijuana. Look from 2010 to 2018 on the far ends. And so we're seeing something happening here. By the way, we do have the highest marijuana use in the state except one, one, one variable is beating us. And that's sixth to twelfth grade use. Okay, that's total numbers. I don't have the bandwidth to crush all that kind of data. This is something that's done by UGA. They go in and crush it specifically for marijuana. Um, we are second only to the juvenile justice system schools. Okay. Uh, is the marijuana use, is that ingested marijuana? So does that include like edibles or is it only smoked marijuana? Used marijuana is the question. I think how does that, how does it read there? Go back and read for me. Um, you the, how, did you use marijuana or hashish? Okay. 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 Next. Sorry, sorry. And maybe you're going to address it later on in the presentation, but why do you think you jumped so much from 2010 to future years? Those numbers just seem... These numbers are not consistent with, well, with the marijuana, you know, this city has changed in 10 years. Anybody lived here for 10 years? Okay. Have you seen it change in 10 years? Yeah. Okay. This city has changed in 10 years. Um, we're just, it, you know, it kind of went phew. Numbers. Numbers wise. Are you talking about well, like population density? Or population what? density has changed. Um, <clears throat> economics have changed. Well, and the attitude about marijuana nationwide has changed. And the attitude about, not just marijuana, but the attitude about alcohol has changed in this community. Okay. For all of that graph, you're missing like 2011, 2012. So it might there was not enough. There was not enough uh, data. There was something that went on with the data in that year, <laughs> right. and I'm so I didn't put it in the there. Jump might have been a little bit more gradual yes. over each year. Yes. Like but uh, thank you for noting that. Um, but you're looking. We're we're way up there. I went and I went and compared us to every other school system in Georgia, just on the alcohol, just on the senior variable, because this data is very clunky and it's not that user friendly. And we are the highest in the state. Our school system has the highest alcohol use rate among high school seniors in the state of Georgia. Do you know the range for alcohol use among the school system in Georgia? I'm just trying to think. Um, most of them were below 20. Oh gosh. <clears throat> so, did I hear we're the highest in alcohol and marijuana? Second highest in marijuana. The but juvenile justice, <laughs> justice schools being us out on that one. And, but number one, we're higher than the juvenile justice and everybody in, in alcohol. alcohol. Yeah, yeah. juvenile justice is a problem because that's the YDCs. That's yeah. the that's the YDCs. That's the juvie jail schools, guys. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that's kids who've just been put in there. They've been on the streets. 
So their chances of, uh, okay, yeah, I see the look, I'm sorry. Okay, um, this one is cut off a little, my apologies. Okay, um, tracking the class of 2019. Because someone told me they thought it would be interesting to track a class. Now that's not a child, it's just the cohort. Okay, so, and here, who had been asking about tobacco cigarettes? Oh, I have. Okay, here we go. In that class, the current class of last year, 2019, when they were at ninth grade, there was 2% <coughs> cigarette use. And that was specifically about cigarettes, not chewing tobacco, not snuff, okay? And you can see where it crept up a bit. We started about that time, though, collecting data on vaping as well. Look where we're at on the vaping. The vaping is on the far right-hand side. So we're alcohol 30 day, then binge drinking 30 day. And those bottom numbers, that's where they are in ninth grade. Then they get there to 10th grade. See the jumps? Can I just clarify? Yes. But in 12th grade, it's just the maroon bar. Yes. It's not the sum of all So if, if, I, if, if I'm reading this correctly, for vaping, this was the percentage in ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, 12th grade. Correct. And that is on the web page if you want to go and really look at that, okay, because I see that it's not that clear here. But 35% of the seniors last year, by the time they left high school, were vaping in the last 30 days. Yes? What is the second to last? Ah, thank you. In your NMUPD. Sorry. Did you say all of them? Okay. Alcohol was 30-day use. It went That's 15... Not. 23, 27, 44. Binge drinking went from 6, 10, 13, 21. Again, 9th grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, 12th grade. Okay. Cigarettes, 2%, 6%, 7%, dropped back down to 6%. Then we went to marijuana, 8%, 20%, <laughs> 23%, 32%. This was done, I believe, in February or March okay, of 2019. Uh, NMUPD, I'm sorry for shortening that, but it is a very long thing. Non-medical use of prescription drugs. So it could be Adderall. It could be Xanax. Who knows? Okay. Non-medical use went from 12%. 13%, 12%, excuse me, 5%, 7%, 9%, and then it dropped back down. Because they found other stuff. That, well, maybe. <laughs> well, we started doing a lot of drug take back right during that time frame, quite honestly. We started having y'all dispose of a lot of drugs in your home. Um, vaping products, 12% in ninth grade, 13, 21, 35. Sorry, I just I wonder do we have any data on the number of students who have part time jobs? Is there I wonder if anyone's done that any is not correlated on this survey. Um, quick question on the vape products, does that include because can't you vape marijuana? Yes, yeah, so it, it only says vaping. It does not specify which substance. Okay. And I know I've had to be very careful about that just in seeking grant funding. I've had to go after nicotine and marijuana in order to be able to address vaping. And quite honestly, the test takes so long to get back of what's what. And because most of the vaping CBD fluids have a little bit of THC, they're coming back positive for marijuana. It's a mess. It's, it's a nightmare. It's I mean, they're, they're vaping stuff that like we don't even know what it is. It's like it could be a tobacco type of product. It could be CBD oil that maybe has no THC. It could be like you know something that has a ton of THC that is definitely to vape that they vape. It's, it's, it's a bunch of stuff. Who knows? Let's pop over to the next one. This is one that may interest you guys. Going from eighth to ninth grade, we went from four percent alcohol use in eighth grade. To when they were in the ninth grade, that same cohort, it jumped to 16%. Let me get out of your way so you can do this. Uh, the binge drinking went, and that's five or more drinks on one sitting. 
Okay. Um, went from 1% to 8%. Uh, vaping went from 3% to 17%. Eh. Okay. Um, marijuana went from 1% to 12%. Prescription drug use, non-medical prescription drug use, non-medical. Because when they ask about the prescription drugs on the survey, you have to really dive into the data. And so the question we're using on that one is, if they don't ask a time frame on that one. Have you used prescription drugs without being prescribed and for what reason? If it's a medical reason but they weren't prescribed, I take it out because you may have given it to your child and it was his brother's. Not a good idea, sharing is not caring, but however. <laughs> um, so that's where we're at with middle school. Can I ask something about that? I came to a Jeff presentation like this a, a few years ago and that was the thing that struck me, that, would, that our numbers for our 6th, 7th, and 8th graders were really not that bad. It, they were pretty, I mean not great, but okay. And it was that that Transition summer year. between eighth and ninth grade that that what I don't know what happened but it just is this well it's the summer? summer it's not just the summer it's what I happened know, between know. February March in their eighth grade year to February March in their ninth grade year spring break spring so break homecoming, homecoming. homecoming football games hanging out at the square with no supervision um, all kinds of things happen by the time they hit that grade level. Okay. Yes, and then you can skip over that one. These are scary numbers. However, one of the things I will tell you that's hopeful is that our kids tend to start later. Um, they don't tend to, they do tend to peak a bit more, but the kids indicator do tend to start later. That is one number that I was looking at this week that someone had done a report for me that was showing that our kids don't tend to start as early as other kids and other around the state. However, once they start, boy, they're, they're off and running. Um, and why don't we want young kids using? Because isn't this just a rite of passage? Don't they just, you know, they did this in Europe, you know. It's just a little weed. Um, the reasons we don't, we know that we're looking at emotional problems, behavioral problems, not for every one of them, but enough to be concerned. Um, addiction and dependence. The kids who actually get addicted to marijuana, marijuana is addictive. If you're not addicted yet, you just keep on smoking. Um, risky sex. Especially we see that with alcohol and some of the other drugs. Um, learning problems. Uh, you're going to drop about, if you're um, using alcohol, even somewhat casually, uh, the kids, are, they're seeing um, IQ drops. Grab some of those brochures on the way out about Save the Brain. Okay? Um, and that's, that's episodic drinking. You're seeing um, about eight IQ point drops. You're seeing IQ drops in uh, THC use. Um, diseases, brain damage, car accidents. And we certainly saw way more in the cars than we wanted to be seeing here. Yes. And, and there's also like, you know, the vaping that we're still trying to understand, like what damage. We, we don't even know exactly what all the damage is going on with that. And those are deadly. I mean, we're seeing people die from that stuff. Yes, you have a question. Um, do you think, or do you know, from data, if, if there's a correlation between drug and alcohol use and the self-harm and the suicide attempt? Yes. Yes. Is there some correlations between suicide, self-harming, and alcohol and drug use? Absolutely. Uh, we have kids who are self-medicating. Self-medicating. They are hurting. They are stressed. They're not all doing it for fun. Let's go through another one or two. Oh, I think it's good. that's one that uh, parents said where they thought kids were using. If you were aware of kids in where kids go to use alcohol and drugs, please list those locations. Um, it was all over the city, guys. 
that's the nice thing about us being such a nice walkable park city. <laughs> uh, you know, what? how many acres we got over at Legacy, guys? 70 something? 70 something. Yeah, okay. Interesting to compare where parents think they're using versus where the kids actually say they are using. Um, most of the kids, if you ask them, they don't get very specific on that survey, but they do ask. Yeah. And most of it is in your homes. Well, that's what I was thinking, because parents seem to think, oh, it's somewhere else. It's, oh, a scary place like the cemetery or a parking garage, but it's probably their basement. You know, and I think it probably depends on how far along in the chain of using they've gotten to. Yeah. But a lot of them are either using at home or at friends' homes. Yes, sir. Your previous slide showed up a case for, I mean, not up a case, but larger um, letters for cemetery and, and other places. Is that indicating that it's more in there? It was mentioned more. Yeah. The, it the was larger mentioned, the font. The larger the font parents, in those word parents clouds. Parents kids that answered this. Parents. Parents. Okay. Yeah. But if you ask the kids, it would be houses and homes? They didn't really get, they don't drill down specifically with kids on the, t on the questionnaire. Um, of where they say they're using, but when you ask kids, it, does this seem accurate? They're like, yeah. What's about the source when you ask the kids, where do you get the alcohol, where do you get the marijuana? Let's go to the next one. It's easier than you think, guys. Most of these substances are legal for some age, somewhere, somewhere in the United States. Our kids are sharing. Um, our kids have a lot of disposable income. Decatur kids have much more disposable incomes than they used to. You're asking why these numbers are going up? These kids got a lot of money, okay? A lot of disposable income. Um, alcohol is usually obtained from social sources, and what that means is it's not retail. Uh, we, do, we do work with the city. They go in and do compliance checks. The city's pretty good about that. Yeah, you hear about this service station or that service station selling some, um, but a lot of it's social sources, um, and they get older friends to buy it or borrow an older friend's C, uh, ID. But let me tell you, Jen and I were at, the, at one of the pre presentations, and one of the kids came up afterwards and says, there are some really good fake IDs out, out here right now. Okay. And our kids got the money to buy it. Um, prescription drugs, what do you have in your home? And you may not have children who'd be taking it, but I will tell you, I had a child come into my house and steal some of our medication. I was just happened to give him a ride and was stopping by the house for a minute. So babysitters, dog walkers, maids. I had a friend whose 60-something-year-old mother used to go in after funerals and clean out the medicine cabinets. Um, Over-the-counter drugs are usually gotten the same way. Marijuana is usually gotten locally from friends, older siblings, extended family members, or a kid who knows somebody. And if you will go online, um, oh, I found some wonderful opioids on OfferUp. Yeah. Syrups. Pres prescription cough syrups. Uh, what is it, fenugreek? Not background. Um, there's a prescription cough syrup. Hmm? Coding. It's a coding syrup. Yeah, yeah. Online. Guy would deliver it to your house for 800 bucks. So, okay. And why are our kids using, and then we're going to stop here and talk. <coughs> One reason they use is other people. They see it around. It's available. Other people are doing it. Popular media. If you listen to some of the media, if you watch a movie, it's hard to watch a movie without some kind of drug in it. Um, escape and self-medication, boredom, rebellion, kids like instant gratification, don't we all? Um, lack of confidence and misinformation. And again, all this is on the PowerPoint presentation. Um, these are scary numbers, aren't they? And people all people tend to think I'm running around going, the, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. I think when I came over here like seven or eight years ago, when they were first kicking off and we were seeing this this increase, people thought, I, Nia Schooler thought I had lost my mind. She says, you don't know these kids. And I'm like, and then she says, you know what, maybe you do. Um, so, this is scary. However, you are the best line of defense. Talking about it makes all 
the difference in the world. If they're going to use, are you going to make it easy for them or hard for them? It doesn't have to be like don't like you know. It doesn't have to be. She's not saying to be a lecture, no. lecture your kids on this, but just when they know that you know and that you're talking about it here and there every once in a while, that it's on, they know that it's on your radar can make the difference. Is it effective to just kind of lay out the facts for them about brain damage and car accidents and stuff like that? The earlier you do that, the better. Uh, but the bottom line is that you've got to find out what the hook is for them. And this is something we're doing we have a prevention program going in the sixth grade class, some of the sixth grade connections, and now we just slid it in to the eighth grade health classes. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> um, and why not get high? I mean, that's a question you have to ask yourself. Of what, what reason would your child have to not get high? How does this interfere with their life goals? How does this mess with them? Can they afford eight points on their SAT. Can they afford to see their grades drop that much? So you have to personalize it. But when I say make it hard for them, if, and this is why we encourage you guys to look at the parent pledge very seriously. It is not feasible to lock up every bottle of alcohol in your home. I wish it was, but it's not. Because some of y'all are going to have a bottle of wine in the refrigerator that's partially open. Know how much is in there. Know how much is in the refrigerator. If you've got alcohol in the refrigerator, know how much is there. If you've got prescription drugs or over-the-counter stuff like cough syrups, that stuff needs to be locked up and it doesn't have to be complicated. Locking file box from Walmart <coughs> that you can do a combination of, cheap and simple. If you can lock up your alcohol, so much the better because yours may not be locked. Yours may be locked up, but hers may not be. And this is where we're talking about as a community. And that's why I'm saying if they're going to get it, God, make them work for it. Okay? Make them really have to try to get it. And the story I heard out of my house was, uh, they still don't know that we read this one. Somebody to the spring break plan was taking a tablespoon of vodka into the water bottle tablespoon a week to get ready for spring break. <laughs> <laughs> I love this. Yeah, they're creative. Guys, they are creative. You've really got to give it to them. Um, part of this comes around to supervision as well. And do you know where your child is? Do you really know? Are you keeping contact with them? Texting is wonderful. Texting, if you know they're going somewhere, to know you're making good decisions. <laughs> My mother will kill me if I do this. Oh, you can always be the bad guy. My mother will kill me. Um, so it really is important that the earlier you talk about this, Kunle, I'm not sure, but I think you may have one of the youngest children in the room. Do we yeah. want to do a competition for a minute? How old's your baby? Two? Two. two. Anybody got one below two? Yeah. <laughs> okay, all right. We got him at the right age, okay. Um, the other thing that, and this I'm going to have to tread very carefully on because I do not want to be seen as the fun police, but what are we modeling for our children? I'm tired. I need a glass of wine right now. It was a bad day to quit drinking. The things that come out of our mouths... Even if you're not going in there and, you know, oh, let me have some mommy juice. Even if you're not going in there and having it, and how many times have you heard that, right? For some of you guys. Even if you're not going and doing it, the kids are hearing it. And our teenagers that we work with in our high school leadership team, some of y'all may have seen a poster they did a couple of years ago about, you know, when your kids hear you say, I need a glass of wine, what message does that send? I'm not saying don't drink. That's not my message here for you. But what are we modeling? We are definitely, Decatur did not used to be a drinking destination. I can, can anybody besides me remember when this city was not a drinking destination? 
pre-brick store? Yeah. Yes, pre-brick store. <laughs> and, I'm, and they're wonderful people, by the way. Miss Eve, yes. how long have you been in Decatur? Born and raised in Decatur. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Has Decatur always been a drinking destination? Yeah. yeah. And But every time you turn around now, every event, does it involve alcohol? Yes. Mm -hmm. I asked the seventh graders a couple of weeks ago in the class, how many of y'all have smelled weed in the community? How many of y'all smelled it on the square? How many of y'all smelled it in the parks? And the kids were all just like this. The few that did not raise their hands, I said, have you smelled it anywhere? Oh, yeah, my neighbor's yard. Okay. How many of y'all have, I'm going to do the survey here. How many of y'all smelled weed in this community? I have lived in Mountain Park for 30-something years. I can count on a hand how many times I have smelled weed. What does that say about our community? And I don't know. Y'all tell me, what does that say? If everybody in this room has smelled weed somewhere in the city. What does it make you think? What does that tell a child? That we think it's okay. It's acceptable. And if we're not talking about it, they're going to make their own interpretations. <clears throat> they will make their own interpretations. Um, and guys, we are pretty close to, you know, we already have <coughs> CBD that has a small amount, that the CBD stores is allowed to sell 0.5% with THC in it. It's a nominal amount. Okay. But dispensaries are now legal in Georgia. Keep your eyes open, guys. I just keep visioning a dispensary on the, on the square. Wait, what? Yeah, what? How'd that happen? Medical dispensaries are legal in Georgia, and there is no limit on the number. So, so part of that talk with the kids is the huge. I, I hope that Mr. Weissman talked about the talk with his son about the beautiful brains he got to see them. What's that? Your son got to see some beautiful brains from Yuki. He didn't say a word. I the brains. Did your son tell you he saw brains? No. Oh my God! I need to go home and talk to him. He doesn't say anything about this. Yeah. So he had two <laughs> like brains on Monday in IG psychology classes, but it's talking about the difference between their brain and our. Brain. <coughs> our brains are different than their brains. Their brains aren't finished developing, and they're not finished until, on average. 25 years old. The linkage between where you make good choices to the rest of the brain hasn't finished making that channel until around 25. So your so brain's the developed. The is I can drink if I'm doing it. It's legal for me to drink. And if I'm doing it reasonably, it's not doing the same thing to my brain that it's doing to yours. It, it establishes pathways much quicker in an adolescent brain, and therefore the addiction occurs much quicker. Yeah. Okay? The pathways are happening. You see how quick, how hard it is for you to learn something versus them? Hello, when they really want to? Their brain learns about it, their brain learns about behavior seeking pleasure the same way. So the city has changed, and I think this one slipped up on us, guys. And that, you know, we, we, this, the city has changed, the economics have changed, we are seeing more and more. We now have 78 alcohol licenses within a four square mile area. Well, and I think there's something else too. It's not, and because like, when you say those kind of things, it's about kind of the recreational thing, but I keep going back to. Um, like the data that Heather was talk, was sharing about like the self-harm and the suicide and then you mentioned earlier about like kids who are not doing this recreationally but are doing it like to self-medicate um, and I, I mean I don't have that this data but like it just seems you know I've only been here this is my only my second full year here but you know the instances of kids that are in, like pretty serious emotional and, and, and mental distress is, 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 is 
unbelievable, and it's mm -hmm. and I, I feel like just like our, you know, I, I, you know, like shame on us as parents, shame on us as, as as educators, shame on us as a society. But like the stress that kids and adults are all in, I think, is just having profound effects on all of us, and. Um, you know, we have kids that are struggling, struggling. Um, you know, I have kids at Renfro in multiple, multiple kids in each grade that have been hospitalized for, for emotional, mental concerns. Multiple kids this year in each grade level. It is real. Why? It is real. Why are they so, like, what? Well, it might not, I, mean, I wouldn't just say it's just because it's stress. I mean, you know, no, I mean, there's always going to be a Why are, why are they in such pain? Yeah. yeah. And, you know, you can, we can look at a lot of different things. We're, we're, we're looking at actually having a movie uh, sometime in the middle of the winter uh, on looking at some of the emotional pain and the reasons for the emotional pain that our kids are in. Uh, because... My experience in working with kids with addiction, is I've done this for over 30 years, is that kids who are doing it for instant gratification, fun, what the hell, you know, kind of stuff, oh, well, let's just do it. Um, those kids, if it bites them on the hiney and they get in a little bit of trouble with it, they stop. But then there are the group of kids who are miserable, who are in pain whether it's stress, mental health disorders, family concerns, whatever you want to, to, to figure out. But these kids are miserable. The kids who are miserable, they go right on through that gate and keep using. And then things, then you've got multiple problems you're dealing with at that point. So using is part of the self-harm. Yes. Say that again. Using is part of the self-harm, not so much on the survey when they report self-harm, but definitely I see it as part of the self-harm for them. Do we have those numbers for previous years? Because I, I think it would be very interesting to know, because I mean, 4% of the high school students seems high to me. It's higher than I would have expected. And the number of Renfro students that have also attempted suicide or self-harm seems very high. And I'm just curious. Has that been consistent over a number of years, or has that spiked recently? And if so, I wonder if we can... I haven't been tracking it that long. Yeah, and maybe we should start tracking it. <laughs> I can go in there, maybe over the holidays. Yeah. I'll go in there and play okay. with that, and then put something on our... our follow us on Facebook. I'll put something on Facebook yeah. about it. So um, what DPI. Else is the DPI, Decatur Prevention Initiative. Follow me on Facebook on that. Have you looked up... Adverse childhood experiences. Yes, have we have. We are not doing. We're not doing the ACEs screening yet. It's important. Uh, but we probably should be. That's so important. Um, what is that? Adverse childhood experiences, ACE, and there's a clear da data that the earlier when kids go through, such as you know, sexual abuse, violence, parents divorce, whatever it is. <coughs> Isolation. They, they've been through a traumatic life experience. Mm -hmm. they've, they've, they've been in a refugee camp. I mean, they've seen somebody die. Those impact them Trauma. emotionally, Trauma. mentally, different levels. And that's oftentimes a very good reason for self-medication. And traumas, that's a real issue that leads to self-harm and such, suicides and such. So, And these days there are ways to mitigate those effects. Absolutely. And this is why we're just saying, guys, it's important to have this conversation and to talk with your kids about, you know, you may hear people say this stuff feels good, but do you want to train your brain to feel good that way? And if you're not feeling good, here are some ways we can get you some help. But again, we also have to be conscious of how we voice things. If, if our kids see us coming in from a bad day and dealing with our stress or dealing with our depression, because let's get it out there, guys, you know, some of us get a good round of that, too. Um, if they see us dealing with our emotional issues chemically, that's sending a message to them as well. 
I'm not saying you can't have a glass of wine, but I'm just saying be conscious of that and have conversations around that and have your friends have conversations around that. Jen has taken on something that I am so excited about and that's our parent coffees. And one of the reasons that we have parent coffees, you want to share that, Jen? Besides getting parents of the same grade level or same interest to group together, is... Well, I mean, one of the first things I learned was um, I currently have a 10th grader, and we started this last year, the year before, and um, I realized I have two older children that have already graduated high school, and I realized all my friend circles are from that, those older children. And I'm looking around going, I don't, I don't know any of these parents. I, I don't know any of the kids. I mean, she'll tell me names, but that doesn't mean I know anybody. Uh, and the city's grown, so that's not my friend circle. So, um, but back when my older kids were in school, and anybody, I mean, my habit is, if my even my poor kids, even when they're in their senior year of high school, and they say they're going to a party, I'm like, oh, great, give me the parent's name. And I go ahead and I call. I, I'm doing that with my seniors, and I'm not trying to, like, I mean, I, you know, I just want to know, and I want somebody else to hear my voice. So I call, and I usually pose it as, hey, I hear kids are coming over to your house. Can I send any snacks over? And most, uh, there was a couple times where the parents were like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> I mean, and we took down some really, you know, and that's one of those years, we took one down, and then the next party I didn't know anything about that my daughter ended up at, there was actually, actually um, gun use happening at that party. This is only four years ago. In England, what a state's neighborhood. I mean, it's right here. So, um, if I'm not, call, you know, it's my job to know where my kids are going, and, and they can lie to me, and I, I can even track them, and they can leave a phone somewhere. But it, it's working with the parents together, too. It's just saying, and they're still going to get by with stuff, I know that. But if we're not at least doing these basic things, so I can't do that if I don't know you, and I don't know your phone number, and I don't feel comfortable, like, I, I, you know, if I didn't know you, am I going to call you? I <coughs> here. So even this year, I don't know a lot of her friends, and I'm still, and she knows, if I say, oh, okay, what's the parent's name, and can I have their phone number? She just already knows, and she gets it to me, and I just use, even now, I'll just even use texting, but I'll just say that gentle thing of, I hear they're coming over, do you need anything, can I send snacks? And that at least then somebody knows I'm knowing where my kid is, and it's, you know, getting that, that line of communication open. So, that helps with me having the coffees. I've almost been at almost every one of the coffees. And I don't care what grade it is. Hey, I'm a little bit social on that, and I like doing that. But the other thing is me getting to know more parents. I want to know you. I'm not here to judge you. I'm not here to, but I want to do it with you. So the coffees are helpful that way. So that's what yeah. she's And the kids about. running out Airbnbs is a real thing. It is a real thing. Every single Wait, year. What? Renting out Airbnbs for parties. For parties. On the in and around the <coughs> And if you really want to ask me about spring break, and it's not just spring break, now that the gator has February break, September break, and 30A, and blah, blah, blah. And I, I have an Airbnb. I don't live in the community. But I have an Airbnb, and let me tell you, I have to how many, really, how many, really how many, how many, how many of your high school kids have a, have a debit card? That's all it takes. A debit card, and they got somebody in their crowd who's 18. Okay. Yeah, oh my God! How old is your kid? Yes. How old is your kid? How old is your kid? I have a, uh, well, I have one that's in a, a Georgia, a second year in Georgia State, and I've got one that's a, a junior at the high school. The junior has a debit card. Okay. Well, yes, Scott. Grader has a, a debit card. Yeah. A sixth grader, I think. I think the eighth grader, sixth. To, to sign up on, on Airbnb, you do have to have a driver's license. You do have to have some sort of photo ID. I require a driver's license, but I don't I don't rent to under 21, but not everybody's as discriminating as I am. Yes, Scott. So, uh, whenever I hear things like this, and you know, I, I also pay attention a lot about cell phone use and screen time, and if we're looking at other risky behavior, whether it's being sexually active, every time I hear statistics, I'm going to run home and, you know, start Operation Crackdown. <laughs> That's what I want to do, but I can't, I can't do that. No. 
And so, I mean, I'm lucky in that I get to be with my kids a lot. And it's, about, it's not just about having a conversation about this, because whenever I bring up alcohol, it's like, whoa, what's that about? It's having conversations with them about everything, all the time. And if they can't and talk to you about the little about stuff, then they're not going to bring it to you, oh my god, I had unprotected sex. You know, if they can't talk to you about, oh my God, Susie's driving me nuts, that channel has to be open. Or Susie's having real struggles and I'm afraid for her. Yeah. Um, so I remember asking a friend if she was going to lock up her alcohol, um, and she said, no, because instead we're going to we're going to have conversations about it. We're going to model, you know, moderate drinking and that kind of. You know, that, that's been my idea too, but is that naive? I think that's a real personal choice. Mm -hmm. um, you can imagine, I don't, I don't even have alcohol in my house <coughs> many years ago. Um, but my sister refused to lock hers up. And boy, did my daughter develop a problem from that. And, you know, and I wish she had. Uh, at least made it harder for her so that it wasn't so easily accessible, especially in the middle school and early high school years. That it was way too accessible to her way too early, I had no idea. Well, and even, I mean, thinking back when I was in high school, um, one of my neighbor's parents didn't lock anything up, and even though that their child was, wouldn't, I don't think, have thought on her own to drink it, Boy, when a few of us end up at their house one day, there were some others who were like, well, what is that? And so even if that child, you know, what you were saying earlier about going in the cabinets and stuff. Um, However, what, what could present an issue to you is if, if her child comes over to your house, gets drunk and hurts herself, guess who it's on? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes? I've been hearing about uh, parents drug testing for marijuana at home. What's the deal with those kids? Are they accurate? What are your thoughts about doing that with with kids as like precautionary or? You know, I don't want to get into what would be your parenting style. Um, but are they accurate? And if if I were really serious about it, I'd run them over to my pediatrician's office and not and not get the one from the Dollar Tree. Um, and be serious and be serious about it. Uh, my son did something, and I had not drug screened him before, and he did something that was so bizarre that I said, "You have got to be high." Uh, he pierced his belly button with a fish hook. Oh, and I was like, "You have got to be high. You're going to get a tetanus shot." And oh, by the way, while you're there. We're going to drug screen you because you've got to be high. And, and I said, by the way, you're paying for your drug screen. And he wasn't using. But it was just one of those that, <laughs> you know, I didn't do it. I didn't do it but a couple of times. But it was really when behavior warranted for me. But how about any of the rest of you parents in here? This is the beauty of this. Would you ask her? Y'all need to ask each other these questions. When you're going, oh my God, do I need to drug screen him? Who can you call who's not going to judge you? I know I can call Jen. <laughs> Jen's not going to judge me if I tell her my daughter's got off the deep end. You know, that's just the relationship I think we've I, we have developed. Yeah. Um. So to your point earlier, Operation Crackdown, I, that uh, happened to my nephew. Uh, he's now at college, they kind of shut him down, and he went to college, and like they don't have a relationship anymore. And I kind of wonder, do you have any like basic pointers on, like, okay, you know that your kid is using, you know, alcohol or whatever it is, like, how do I confront them and still like maintain channels? Like, I love what do you. you do? I love you. And it's always through a voice of caring, not wanting to punish them. And along that line, I've heard from some parents <coughs> that they want their kids to experiment now while they still live with them. Mm -hmm. I've heard that too. Yeah. Yes, I've never known a kid who would drink at home who wouldn't drink somewhere else. 
Yeah, that's just yeah. yeah. The statistics do show on that. Yeah, you make it open for them at home, and you know they're still going everywhere else and doing it. Um, that's and it's not training like, them any better. And again, their brain, <laughs> their brain is still the undeveloped brain. But it's the conversations. It's, it's getting going on the conversations out of love. And I mean, sometimes you have to go slowly. Yeah. If you haven't had that going on, those type of conversations. You're going to have to ease into those, right? And, and kids don't yeah. tell secrets, so, like, I would just, you know, caution a parent who feels that they're going to do it, you know, have their kids do it in their supervision, and then they blab it, and as a mandated reporter, I hear that Johnny got high under the supervision of his or her dad, then I have to make a phone call. It gets interesting. One of the things for me, because you know, I'm not sitting here as a perfect parent, okay, and my uh, and we're all sitting here going, oh. Um, but when something unusual is going on with my daughter, I can say, you know, Bree, this isn't like you. What's up? I'm worried about you, <clears throat> as opposed to I want to nail you down. And so I think always coming from a place of love and concern and non-judgmental and being ready to hear, yes, I am using, yes, I am doing, coming from that place. But for me, one of the things that has been very important as she's been going through some rough times has been to not shut off doors, to not say anything that I feel like is going to destroy the relationship and to be very careful about if I'm in temper or too emotional to give myself a break, and self-care. Okay. Does this give you guys some general ideas? But the main thing is, I want you to talk to you. I want y'all to talk to each other. Talk to each other, talk to your kids. Talk to each That's other, talk to your kids. There's two takeaways right there. Relationships, yes. Would you be open, or would you consider doing this for Fave kids too, Fave and Tally? Absolutely, we've been trying to get them over here. We need, we need we're willing to go over there. And what we need are more volunteers in those grades. I'm old. <laughs> and I'm going to age out. I was, I was, I'm was. more than willing to go up. I'll go anywhere. Y'all know me. I'll talk anywhere. Have you approached anyone there? Yes. yes. So right now, I've got a few. Of, I'm starting with, where I'm starting with it is trying to get some of the coffees going with the younger grades mm -hmm. so that we get the parents hooked. Mm -hmm. Uh, and yes, we do have in the works the first thing we were talking about. I talked about up here. Um, there's a perfect target to be having the electronics conversation. So we want to host it over there and start getting. Uh, yeah, really out. fix that over there. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, the earlier you talk, the better. And somebody else had a quick question. Oh, yes, sir. Um, isn't it that the kids at that age? They're missing something. They're missing information that is detailed and technical enough to help them connect why what they're using is a danger. So at that age, they're not mature enough to say, well, if I take arsenic, this is what happens by showing pictures of how it happens or even the mechanism by which it happens and then you die or you get hurt. They I, don't wish, have, I, wish we, I wish we could scare them into not doing this. And, and I, I, I heard that term already, but, but I'm saying number eight there is misinformation slash information. If a kid can articulate how glucose gets into your body and makes your muscle work, which they will understand at grade nine, grade eight, why not we tell them how the molecule heroin, when you take it in, what happens? Show them the pictures and tell them, yes, for well, now you feel good, but it has a progression that maybe in the third month you will start shaking or something, or something will happen to you. And then those who are using, even if they don't tell you, when you said that in three months you're going to have X and they start feeling it, they might say, oh my God, maybe that is true, I need to stop this. I do some of that when I go in with the seventh grade classes okay, here, um, but factual stuff often doesn't change behavior. Yeah. It doesn't send, tend I to mean, motivate them. Do it for adults. So why would I do and, it? You know, I mean, it? just because I know that eating ice cream before bed at night is not good for me, it doesn't <laughs> stop me from doing it. Right. You know, and so that's the, that's the disconnect. I've got to want something bad enough 
to make that not a good idea. Right, it's not to stop, it's to know when you start sweating, why you sweating. Why are you sweating? <coughs> or why are you coughing? So, yeah. well that's, yeah, that's the frustration that, you know, you present them with facts and they don't, it doesn't, it doesn't take. So, so like, it's more why wouldn't you use? It's more information. Yeah. The more the information. The question would be more of why, why not. And I'm aware that we've got some folks that we told y'all we were going to end at 8. So we're going to end out. And I'm going to hang out for questions. Greg will hang out for questions. And please do a survey and tell us what you want more of or less of. Kool-Aid. Okay, so question the other counties, the other schools that are not consuming as much as are there reasons they have? Are there any programs? Our community, our community, no, our community norms are, are getting us, guys. Mm. It's not that they're doing norms. better preventative no, stuff. No, they're not. I know.